after it closes. So we were talking about chapter 5. We're really just getting barely into it, but um, hopefully one of the things you learned from the previous lecture was that it depends what kind of organism you're dealing with. And this particular slide shows you a lot of different organisms that are difficult to kill, resistant to many agents that we use. Yeah, there's a little card coming around for you to sign in today because I don't have the sign-in sheet, so I'll just use that for credit. So just put your name on that as it comes past you. Um, so we talked a bit about the endospores previously and how they're difficult to kill. Um, protozoan and their oocysts and cysts, they're oftentimes very, very difficult. We talked about that in relationship to the cryptosporidium and swimming pools, how they have to spike up the chlorine in the pools. And the mycobacterium, they have that mycolic acid in their cell wall, so that makes it difficult for many chemicals to be able to penetrate down inside. And we've already mentioned uh, Pseudomonas is resistant to a lot of different chemicals that are used for disinfectants. It's resistant to cyanide and resistant to a lot of different things. Then there are the viruses, and the viruses, hopefully you remember from chapter one, are broken into two broad groups, those that are referred to as envelope viruses, meaning they have an envelope around the outside of the virus itself, and those that are referred to as naked viruses, they lack that envelope. And for killing of those envelope viruses, all you have to do is disrupt the membrane that's on the outside, so pretty much any detergent can do that. It's just like the lipids that are going to be in oils and other things, and if you can disrupt that membrane or the envelope, then you can kill the envelope viruses. But the naked viruses are much more challenging to kill because those proteins that make up the protein coat or the capsid of the virus usually are held together by strong, stronger charges and therefore much more difficult to be able to disrupt. So uh, last time we were together, I told you guys to go read labels, I'm pretty sure, and I asked you to look at disinfectants that you had. Did some of you bring those those labels? Did, did I actually ask you to bring labels from... I didn't, okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't bring one, but I noticed that when I bought this Kaisal, it says it kills all gram-positive bacteria. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, you guys that have computers, do me a favor real quick. Um, could you go look up Clorox, Clorox wipes real quick? And what we want to know is the efficiency of killing. And could you do liquid Lysol cleaner and go to the, the page that talks about it and um, find out what it kills and how long it takes. And why don't you do one of the other wipes that you've heard about on um, television. So disinfectant wipes. If you Google disinfectant wipes, you'll find some other brand. Tell us which one you're, you're looking at. What's that? Cabasa. Is that a lot? Cabasa. Okay. Yeah, that's not one you can buy for your home. So, uh, And you go ahead and um, take Clorox wipes. They make a disinfectant wipe. So go find out. And what they're going to do on each one of those, what I want you to find is someplace on the advertisement for those guys, they're going to tell you that they kill 99.9% .9 of certain bacteria. Okay? And... I imagine that if you got a 99.9% .9 on an exam, any exam, you'd be pretty happy, right? Yeah, it sounds pretty good, 99.9%, .9 not much less than 100, right? So <clears throat> they almost all advertise that they kill 99.9% .9 of some organisms. Have any of you found those that you're looking for yet? Um, I have Clorox wipes. You have Clorox wipes? Okay, she did Clorox wipes. You find something different then. So... And what do they tell us on their sheet? Um, I clicked on ingredients, and then it just says that they kill 99, or 98% satisfactory, and they kill 99%. So, so they kill 90, 90% 90, 90 of germs? 99%. 99% of germs. They don't tell us which ones? No, and I clicked on ingredients. Okay. Um, and it, nope, it doesn't want to tell me anything. Did anybody find anything that's actually got data? Okay, we're going to skip this then because it's taken too long to get that data. What I want you to do then is for Wednesday, go to your cabinet, pull out all those disinfectants and cleaners that you have. I found and, it. Okay. Um, it's got substrate, uh, hex, ox, Does it uh, say how much, what kind of organisms it kills? No. Okay, that's what I need you to find out. Okay. All right, so go to your cabinet. Scratch that digging. Go to your cabinet, pull out your cleaners, Look at the ones that say on the front of the label, proudly say kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria. 
And then look at the back because if there's going to be an asterisk. There has to be. And look at the back at where it says what bacteria it, they kill. And usually they break them into two different groups. One group gets killed faster than the other, and one group takes longer to be killed. So write down all of that information. Did you find one? Why don't, why don't we not worry about it right now? We'll go do this assignment. Go to your cabinet and look at the containers that you have there for disinfectants. And almost all of them are going to use that number 99.9%. Kills those organisms 99.9%. And it drove me crazy for forever. Because for the longest time, like three, four years, they said they killed 99.9%. Because .9 most people don't get to take a microbiology class. And they, most people think, wow, that's really good. But people who have taken a microbiology class know that they can kill that many possibly, but it takes time to do it. And they didn't tell the consumer whether it was two seconds exposure or two million seconds exposure when they were saying it kills 99.9% .9 of the organisms. And, and what you'll see is when you look at those labels, please do it because then we can work through some math problems when we come back together on Wednesday. What you'll see is that some organisms are harder to kill than others. Some are more resistant to those chemicals than others are. And so we need to know how long does it take to kill those 99.9% .9 of the bacteria. So please, if you have two or three disinfectants, if your, your class is like the others, only a couple of you will do it. I hope you surprise me and five or six of you get different, different disinfectants. Then we can figure out which one's most effective against those organisms that are going to co be commonly out there. But they almost all use that 99.9% .9 because it sounds really good. Okay. So one of the things we have to consider when we're considering disinfectants is the number of microorganisms because the higher the number of organisms, the longer it's going to take to kill them. And that doesn't matter whether it's heat or chemicals or what it is, a population dies at a, a given rate when they're exposed to a, diff, a given chemical. And so uh, the, for a larger population, you need more time. For, obviously, for a smaller population, you need more. Um, organisms can be removed by washing. You can lower the number of organisms by washing the item, and that reduces the amount of time for a disinfectant to work. We use that in a lot of situations. In, in the food processing industry, they usually try to wash away as many organisms as they can from the surface of the fruit, vegetable, or whatever it is, and um, reduce the number. So the, there's a number that you need to know. It's called this decimal redu reduction time. And basically, it's the time it takes to kill 90% of the population. Okay? It's the time it takes to kill 90% of the population. And if we look at the chart that's over here to the right, we can begin to see a couple of things on this chart. If we just look at the y-axis, this axis right here, let me switch pins. If we just look at that y-axis, then we're looking at the number of surviving cells, the number of cells that are surviving in that population. And so the plot's going down, so you assume something's influencing the, the cells that are viable and thus killing them because the plot's going down. So that's something that you can see pretty quickly. And then the x-axis has the time scale on it. How long does it take? And so if we look at this plot, one thing we need to realize is that the y-axis is logarithmic. The x-axis is linear, but the y-axis is logarithmic. And so let's look at these numbers to make sure we're all on the same page on log scale. Um, right here, we've got 10 to the 6th. What is 10 to the 6th in words, that's easy to, words that are easy to say? Million. 1 million, right? And so 10 to the 7 would be 10 million, and 10 to the 8 would be 100 million. Good. What if we go down the other way and we look down here at 10 to the 3rd? What's that? 1,000, right? And 10 to the 4th is 10,000. Okay, everybody on the same page then as far as that goes. All right, good deal. So now at time zero, we start applying our disinfectant to this surface that has these organisms on it. And at time zero, we start out with 10 to the 8 cells. And with 10 to the 8 cells then, we're going to apply this disinfectant, and it's going to be applied, at, and we're going to see death happening because it is a disinfectant. The cells are going to begin to die. And so we start to see this slope. But if we look closely at the top of that slope, right here, at this time point, we have already seen 90% of the cells die. How do we know that? 
you can see the dotted line there. How do we know that's 90%? What's 90% of 100 million? That's what that 10 to the 8th is, right? What's 90% of 100 million? 90% of 100 million would be 90 million, right? So at that time, time point, we've killed 90 million cells, and we have 10 million cells that are still alive. Everybody with me? Okay. So we killed one log. That's one decimal reduction time, or one D value. Okay? However long it took to kill that one log is one decimal reduction time, or one D value. In this case, it looks to be about 20 minutes to kill that many cells. We'll call it 20 just for ease of mathematics here. And so it took 20 minutes to kill how many cells? 90 million cells. And if we look along this plot, we can actually extrapolate any place we want to. And I can't draw as nice a lines as they can, but you can see, again, that in that 20-minute period, you, again, you killed about 90% 90, 90 of the cells. Okay, everybody's good with that so far. So let's come over and use these numbers that, that they've given us. Uh, 10 to the 3 is what? 1,000. And 10 to the 2 is what? One, one hundred, right? 10 to the 2 is 100. Okay, so again, we killed 90% of the cells. How many did we kill this time? We started with, uh, oh yeah, 900, you're right. Sorry, my brain went down one scale. 900 is what we killed, right? Everybody good with that? Okay, how long did it take? Well, how long did it go, take to go from 1,000 to 100? Like yeah, 15, 20 minutes, still the same time, right? Okay, so th basically what you need to see is because this is plotted on a log scale and killing occurs at the same rate the whole way along, then anywhere on that scale you're going to get 1D value. You can measure anywhere. You could have come up here, measured the time, uh, the time it took to kill between uh, 100,000 and 10,000 cells, or you could measure anywhere along that plot. And it's because the killing happens at a, a constant rate, a statistical rate, and when you plug it on a log scale, then it, it converts to a linear plot. What if this wasn't a log scale? What do you think this plot would look like if it wasn't a log scale here? What if we got rid of that log scale and now it's no longer a log scale? What do you think the plot would look like? It'd be much wetter? Choppier? What else you got? Think about what's happening based on the, what it looks like on the log scale. You're killing a whole bunch right here, right? And you're killing more here than here, and more there than here. So if you plotted that on a non-log scale, it would actually look something like this on a linear scale because you got a lot of cells dying really early, and the rate of 90% continues to decrease. But if this scale was now a, log or a linear scale, then you wouldn't have that because this scale is saying this point has 10 times more cells than this point. Everybody's good with that, right? And this scale, this point on the scale has 10 times more than that point, but this point has 100 times more than that. And this point has 1,000 times more than that. Everybody good with that? And this point has 10,000. So what you have to do is expand this scale way up to, so this one, if this was 10, then 100 would be about somewhere there, and 1,000 would be way off the chart up at the top. Everybody good with that? Okay. So the plot would actually drop down pretty quickly and then it would start to taper out like that because of the, the way that it's plotted. So it's much easier to look at it on a log scale plot like we're looking at here. Okay, And so you can use that plot to figure out how long it takes and essentially that's what they did. When they came up with those numbers that they put on labels, they did a killing plot just like this and they used those organisms that are listed there and that's why we need to know, one, what the organisms are that are listed, and two, how long it took. And like I said, usually they break them down into two different groups because some die quickly, others take a longer time to die. 
So let's imagine this plot is actually for E. coli and the ethanol that we use in the laboratory to, to disinfect our benches. And so that's E. coli with ethanol. Now let's imagine that someone broke loose. We're doing the spore stain this week. So someone broke loose and they, they dropped 10 to the 8th endospores on the surface of the bench. And what do you think the plot would look like if you use ethanol to disinfect 10 to the 8th endospores on the bench? What would you guess the plot would look like? It'd still be linear, but what do you think the slope would look like? way flatter, and that's probably not flat enough because ethanol doesn't do anything to endospores. Ethanol can't get inside of the endospores. It can't kill them. They're much more resistant, so the plot would be much flatter. The killing would be much slower. Okay, everybody good with that? So let's say this is E. coli, and E. coli is pretty resistant, but and that's E. coli with ethanol. Let's say we took E. coli and we exposed it to 30% uh, formaldehyde solution that we call formalin, what would you, what would the killing slope look like, if, do you think, if you used formalin? It's going to be much steeper. It's going to be something like this when you plot it. So again, these plots relate the organism that you're looking at and the disinfectant or the chemical that you're looking at to kill them. That's why we need both sets of numbers when you write down the ingredients, or the, not the ingredients, but the organisms that your disinfectants kill because some are going to die quickly, some take longer to die, and we also need to know the time that each one of those groups. So, so either take a snapshot with your camera phone or um, somehow record that information so we can look at it and look at some specific examples when we come together on Wednesday. So when we're talking about food industry, many times they will apply this because sometimes a few organisms in there doesn't matter, and you already know that. We talked about milk and that there are still live organisms in the milk. There are just no organisms that cause disease down inside of the milk. But if you take foods that you want to preserve and you want to last a long time and you know that people are going to be eating them later, if there happens to be one or a few spores of Clostridium botulinum in that food, and the food then is put into a can, and then the can sits on the shelf for six months or a year, and that Clostridium botulinum happens to grow, it may not produce very many cells, but it may produce a lot of toxin. And that toxin, if it's not destroyed by heat, which usually many canned vegetables and canned fruits we don't actually eat, and so those spores could germinate, make the botulism toxin. It's a neurotoxin. It disrupts the neural function of the gut, causes diarrhea. Many times people die. It actually disseminates to the rest of the body, can cause respiratory problems and many other things as well. And so in the commercial industry, they usually are going to um, use the D values, but if they need to kill, they're going to kill way beyond what the expected number of cells might be. So they're going to apply many more D values to the, the food item to make sure that there aren't any um, spores of botulinum there. There are lots of other environmental conditions that we've talked about that impact the effectiveness of a, a disinfecting agent. And so um, we would like to remove dirt, grease, and other things because think about what we're talking about here. We're talking about chemicals. And how do chemicals work to kill bacteria? They react with chemicals that are down inside of the cells or on the surface of the cell, right? And so if you've got these contaminants there as well, the chemicals that you're hoping will, that will react with the cell components are going to react with those contaminants and be deactivated and therefore not be able to deal with the organisms that are there. So it is important to thoroughly clean, remove anything that might be there that might be reactive. Uh, another one is pH and temperature. As far as temperature goes, sodium hypochlorite, that's what's in your, your household bleach, it's pretty effective at killing mycobacterium tuberculosis, but you have to raise up the temperature quite high because uh, that's 55 degrees centigrade, and your body temperature is at 37 degrees centigrade. Your hot water heater is about 65 degrees centigrade. So it's about halfway in between. If you just raise 5 degrees from 50 degrees centigrade up to 55, then you can get twice as fast of killing time. 
the D value drops to half, okay? And you'll see the reason for that when we're doing the acid fast stain this week. To get the stain to penetrate, we actually have to heat up the cells. We heat them up to about 70 degrees centigrade to open up the waxy coating on the surface of the cell so the stain can get down inside. And the same thing is happening here. Softens up that outer layer and helps um, the, the disinfectant to get down inside. And then if we lower the pH, usually an acidic pH, if it doesn't inactivate the chemical, will actually help to uh, increase the function of the, the disinfectant. And the, the reason for that, again, is the, the low pH interacts with the outside of the cell and lets the chemical get down inside more easily. Um, again, we have to uh, consider the situation that we're looking at. The, and one of the things that we have to consider is what's the risk of infection? Um, right now, we know that there are hundreds of bacteria on the surface of your desk, but we're not too worried about them. But if one of you just decided to clean the whole surface of the desk by licking it, I might get a little bit concerned for a number of reasons. Uh, but again, uh, the risk of infection right now is pretty low. Um, some of you apply the five-second rule, and maybe you can get away with that in some situations, but in others, you probably want to take a little bit of caution, and that goes back to risk of infection. When we're thinking about in the medical situation, then we have to look at where instruments that we're wanting to um, disinfect or sterilize in some case are going to be used. And if their items are termed critical items, those are the ones that are going to actually come in contact with internal body tissues. In other words, they're going to puncture the skin or they're going to puncture mucous membranes, and those guys need to be sterile. They have to be sterile. So things that are there are needles, scalpels, some cannulas, some other things that are inserted into the tissues of body. Those have to be sterile before they're used. And then there's other items that are called semi-critical instruments. Uh, these guys uh, don't puncture into the tissue, but they will come in contact with mucous membranes. And so these guys should be virus-free. They should be free of vegetative bacteria. There may still be a few endospores there that are viable, but the endospores are usually going to be trapped by those mucous membranes and, and then removed from the environment that way. Things that fall into this category are going to be things like the endoscopes, um, tra endotracheal tubes, and, and a number of other things that they get inserted into the body, but they only contact the mucous membranes. They don't actually break those or shouldn't break those mucous membranes. And then the third group are called non-critical instruments, and these guys only contact unbroken skin, and that's important because soon, as soon as the skin is broken, then you're back down into the tissues again, and you're op making an opening for any vegetative cells to be able to get into. Um, these guys um, have a, a lower level of disinfection, um, and that's because there's low risk of transmission. Uh, if you've gone to the doctor in the last three or four years, you probably noticed the nurse before she put the stethoscope in or on you somewhere wherever she was listening, she took an alcohol wipe and disinfected the stethoscope. And that's something that's really just come into practice in the last three, four, five years because, again, of those healthcare associated um, infections that are going on. They're trying to at least show you that they're using good practice when they're using that stethoscope. Other things are countertops. I've never seen anybody actually disinfect a uh, blood pressure cuff. You guys let me know when you go into your nursing practice if, if they actually do that, but I've never, ever seen that happen. Let me know how you do it um, when you get there. <coughs> yeah, but usually they're sitting in the clinic and they're on the wall. They just pull them off, strap them on your arm, and you wonder who was in there last, but um, not much gets done beside that. The other thing that we need to consider is the composition of the item that we're looking at. If, and this is important because some sterilization and disinfection methods are going to actually destroy the material. One example is a lot of chemicals are destroyed by heat. Uh, you already knew that because you've made rock candy or other things where you heated the sugar up and it caramelized and turned brown. And, and glucose, the, the sucrose that you heated up, doesn't burn really easily, but glucose does burn really easily. And just a little bit of heat will actually break down glucose. And, and um, so mm, two weeks from now, you're going to be using a media in the laboratory that's called OF glucose. The main carbohydrate is glucose. And to make that one, we really can't heat it and sterilize it the way that we normally do. Uh, so you actually have to use a different method to sterilize the glucose in that. There's some plastics also that heat will warp and some other sensitive items. And so radiation is an alternative to that, but there are some types of radiation that will damage certain plastics. So again, you have to look at the circumstance. Um, many times we'll use moist heat, but if uh, the material 
it will rust or corrode, then moist heat might not be appropriate. And some of the uh, liquid chemical disinfectants are not good for moisture sensitive or other materials that will be um, corroded by those. So again, you have to consider what the composition of the environment is. So if we use heat treatment, heat treatment's the easiest. You guys already started doing that in the laboratory. Um, you use incineration with your loops when you were transferring bacteria. It's reliable, it's fast, it's safe, it's cheap, it's relatively non-toxic, and it can be used to either sterilize or disinfect, either one of those, depending on the time that you apply it. And we use dry heat in the lab so far, but if you come in the back, you'll see that we have an autoclave where we can use moist heat to sterilize items like the media that we um, use. And so moist heat is good. It works by irrever irreversibly denaturing proteins. Um, you can do boiling, and if you're out in the wild and you don't have any fresh water, boiling is definitely better than nothing, but boiling won't deal with a lot of the oocysts and um, for sure endospores that might be in that water, so you need to be careful about those guys. You know the term pasteurization already. What items do you know of that are pasteurized? Milk, Milk is the big one that we have that's pasteurized in the U.S. What else do you know? Cheese. Cheeses, lots of dairy products. Some orange juices are, yep. Um, so pasteurization, by definition, is designed to destroy pathogens, gets rid of those pathogens, and it reduces the number of spoilage agents, but it doesn't get rid of all of those guys. And I think that's why Monk won't drink milk, um, because he knows where it came from. Why do you think milk products need to be pasteurized? I mean, that, that's mainly the ones that you described. Near the back end of the cow where other good stuff comes out. Have, have you noticed, how many of you bought eggs recently? Uh, did you read the label? Did you notice if they were pasteurized? A lot of the eggs out there are starting to be pasteurized because of salmonellosis that people are getting from eating eggs. So typically we use heat to pasteurize. Uh, where you're, uh, read the label. Were any of your eggs already cooked in the shell when you, when you bought those eggs recently? Did you notice if they were already cooked? Probably weren't, right? So they have to use something else to pasteurize it. But by pasteur's definition, heat's used. In the case of eggs and other foods like lettuce and cantaloupe and many others where we're seeing diseases pop up in humans, they're actually using gamma radiation to pasteurize. And so now by definition, pasteurization is removing the infectious agents, those pathogens that can cause disease, and reducing the number of organisms that can cause spoilage. Yeah. I have never actually bought those. I don't know. You let me know. But if, if they're boiled, they, they may have been pasteurized prior to. And if they're boiled, the boiling process is going to kill more of the pathogens that might be there. So I'm not sure what the regulations are on those. But Yeah, a lot of the times they will add salt. But look at the label next time and see what the ingredients are and, and tell me how they taste. Um, but I feel safer boiling my own eggs. Let's see. So I'm going to have to let you guys go here in just a second, but let me finish this one real quick. Um, so pasteurization in the U.S., we use what's called high-temperature short time. But there's a, another process that's called low-temperature long time. And other countries use that process, low-temperature long time. Uh, we don't here in the U.S. because we drink a lot of dairy products. We want to get them through the processing plant as quickly as possible. So we use this high-temperature short time method of pasteurization. They both do the same thing. They both, both bring the number of organisms down to the same level. They both kill all the pathogens and reduce those spoiling agents. Um, but the process is just a little bit different. Obviously, one uses a higher temperature, so it can do it faster. The other one uses a lower temperature, so it can do it more slowly. Uh, this is curious, so check this out. If you want to pasteurize milk, it takes 72 degrees for 15 seconds. But if you want to pasteurize ice cream, it takes 82 degrees for 20 seconds. What do you think the difference is? The consistency. The consistency. So what would the differences in the consistency be? Thicker. Thicker. Richer. What's that mean, thicker? There's more cream in it. If there's more cream and, and there's more of one other ingredient in ice cream as well, what other big, what would you say? Protein. Oh, I thought you said cocaine. <laughs> um, um, 
not my ice cream. Um, more protein in ice cream? I don't know about that one. Sugar. There's a lot more sugar in ice cream, right? There's one other ingredient. Yeah, there is more protein because they add these. Um, well, that's going to be more lipids, yeah. And then there's also a lot more eggs in ice cream. Like milk doesn't have any eggs, right? Yeah. Um, so, so to pasteurize... One, from chapter two, what do you know about water? Water's very reactive, right? If you raise the lipid content, if you raise the sugar content, if you raise the protein content, what do you think you're doing to the water? You're reducing the water content. And so there's less water, so there's less to be reactive. Lipids aren't very reactive. And so when you reduce the water content, you have to raise up the temperature and you have to expose for longer to be able to kill those pathogens that might be down inside of them. So the other thing I want you to do is go and... Do any of you have whipping cream or half and half in your refrigerator? Yes. Go read the label on that guy and find the expiration date on your whipping cream or your half and half. Read the expiration date, and we'll talk about those when we come back next time. Sorry I got to run early today. We'll see you on Wednesday, or if not before.